and welcome to my studio. I want to share with you today something that I discovered yesterday by accident and it might just be a new way to approach an underpainting and I'm going to call it the wet rag underpainting. So I'm really excited. I'm going to show you how I did it, why I did it, and then I'm going to go ahead and paint on top of my wet rag underpainting. Uh, before I get started though, I just want to share with you that I am excited about this opportunity to have to share with you lots of fun things that I'm going to be doing in my studio now that we're all have a lot of free time on our hand. There's no better way to relax and to have a moment of zen than to get into the studio and paint. And so I am hoping to share at least one or two videos a week uh, showing you what I'm, I'm up to, hopefully giving you motivation or ins inspiration or ideas that you can use in your own work. So um, if you're interested in that, make sure you subscribe to this channel and hit the notification bell so that you'll be notified when I post a new video. And as always, I want to encourage you to stick till the end of the video because in a painting, it always seems to go through that ugly stage. And if you stick with me to the end, you'll get to see the finish. So without further ado, I'm going to get started. And what on earth is a wet rag underpainting? Well, this is what happened to me yesterday. I had a frustrating experience in the studio. I was trying to paint, let's zoom over here. I was trying to paint this scene and I guess I really wasn't too excited about it because I first started with a watercolor underpainting. It just was washed out. Um, then I added some Derwent Ink 10 sticks, which made a brighter underpainting, uh, which was fine. Then I added some texture with clear gesso, and I started painting. I probably got to maybe halfway through, and I thought, you know what? It's not working. I'm not excited about this scene anymore, and I'm actually frustrated. Now, I could have tried to stick with it, but usually a general rule of thumb for me is if I'm no longer excited about the subject, then it's best to part ways with it. So, I don't know what I was thinking, but I had a rag, this is what I'm using now, to wipe my fingers instead of wipes. So it's a wet rag, damp rag, and I thought, hmm. Why not liquefy the pastel on the paper and just wash it off? Or create a, a toned piece of paper. So I just took out all my frustrations and scrubbed it out and this is what I'm left with. And now I have a really interesting toned kind of piece of paper and I'm going to use it to paint not this because I'm no longer excited about that, but something else. Now I want to show you how easy it is to do a wet rag underpainting. I got a wet rag or damp rag, a piece of uh, sanded paper that can really actually get wet. This is an older study of some sort, I don't even remember what it is, but I don't want to waste the paper so I'm going to take that wet rag and just simply wet down the pastel just like this. And what it does is it puts the pastel back in its liquid state and this will dry perfectly ready to accept more pastel. Look at that interesting color. I'm really, I'm, I can get excited about that. All right, so now let's move on. I'm going to just move this out of our way. I will paint on this, though. This is going to be fun. And I'm going to use this as my inspiration. I just put a big dirty mark on it. I'm not going to actually use the top part. I'm going to, let's see if I can stick it up there a little bit better. There we go. This is an early spring, uh, perfect for this time of year, uh, early spring scene. And so what I'm going to do is use this piece of paper and use this as my inspiration. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to decide, is it about the sky or is it about what's happening on the ground with the trees? And it's not going to be about the sky, so that means I'm going to raise my horizon. And I like that it's a little bit of a hill, but I'm going to pull it up slightly so that the eye doesn't get pulled right off the page. So in the photo, it kind of just goes down at a dip. So I'm going to just raise it up just a hair. And then I'm going to put in some of these tree shapes. There are several trees. Some of them are, are bare. Some of them are just getting some foliage. I'm just going to block in a few. And then this is going to be my centerpiece tree right over here, slightly off center. This is a redbud tree. And they're just in the south. They're a beautiful sign of spring, a wonderful hot pink color. And some bare trees kind of in the middle. 
like so. And now I'm also going to, I want to lead us to this centerpiece tree, so I'm going to just make a line which will remind me to create a visual pathway up to this tree. So the second thing that I need to do is block in the painting uh, and create that first layer. I think I'm going to go with uh, blocking in the extremes, meaning the darkest dark, the lightest light, then the most intense color. So I'm using a dark blue new pastel, so that's going to be the perfect color to block in my dark. So I'm going to block in all of the dark shapes, which are the trees, the bare trees, uh, I'm not going to put in as heavily, and I'm not going to block in the pink tree either. And you can see here, I don't know if you can tell on the video, but this is where I put the texture with the clear gesso in the original painting. So it's got a little bit more texture than some of the areas. I'm going to also darken in this leading pathway and the bottom of the painting just to ground everything. So there's the first layer of dark. So it's the darkest dark. The lightest light is going to be the sky. And in this particular uh, time of, of year, or this day, it was our overcast. So I'm going to block it in with a pale pink to kind of give it that moody overcast uh, spring day, not a sunny day. So I'm going to use that pale pink for the lightest light. All right, darkest dark, lightest light. What is the most intense color? It's going to be that hot pink tree. So I'm going to block that in with a hot pink. And I'm using hard pastels right now. These are new pastels. And they are harder, so they don't take up as much of the tooth of the paper. What else is an intense color? How about some of that wonderful spring green in the grass? Let's lead us up to our focus tree. And then everything else, which is really the only thing left is the grass, is going to be a middle value. And I'm going to go ahead and use a middle value pink in this area of the grass. Am I going to leave it pink? No, but it's going to hopefully give some relief to all of the um, greens that are going to be in this area. Now, what I'm noticing is I almost have it, well, it's not quite in the middle. I'm going to raise the horizon just a hair and then raise the trees up just a hair. And I'm going to do it at this early stage because if I waited till I had a lot more pastel done and realized that my horizon was smack dab in the middle, and it almost still is, you know what I can do? I can break up that horizon by staggering the trees and it won't be as noticeable. All right, so always make corrections early on in the painting. All right, so there we have that very first layer. Now, sometimes I rub in this layer with a blending tool, but I'm going to just leave it as it is and jump right into the softer pastels. And in this case, I'm using my set of Terry Ludwig pastels. This is the floral landscape set. And I think it's going to have everything I need except maybe... Well, it might have the hot pink. There we go. So I always begin by blocking in the dark or re, um, redoing the darks so that they get refreshed, refreshed rather, a refresher, reinforcing the dark areas with several layers of dark value pastels. The other thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and put in the tree trunks for um, some of these trees, especially these bare trees right in the middle. I know it's hard to see, but I'm putting them in mostly just so that I have an idea of where they might be. Where else was it dark? It was dark here at the base of the painting, the immediate foreground. So that's one layer of dark. I want to add another layer of dark, so I'm going to add a dark burgundy. I'm going to go and lightly add another layer. And where it comes to the bare trees, I'm just adding a very, very light touch, and I will go and break that up with the sky color. 
that's two layers. Oh, let's put some in the foreground. All right, let's add now the green because after all these are green trees. So I'm gonna add a layer of dark green. And again, in this foreground area. Oops. And here's a, another layer of warm dark green. This has more yellow in it than the previous one. Again, in the foreground area. And there we have the darks all, all re-established. So the next thing that I'm going to do is add a little bit more light to the green trees, and then I'm going to come in and work on the sky. So think about where those trees might be getting some light, probably on the left side. And I'm going to go ahead and re-establish the sky. So I have it as a pale pink. I like that pale pink, so I'm going to use a little bit more of it with a softer pastel. And now I'm going to use it to start to break up the tree shapes. Because right now they're kind of lumpy, right? So you put them in as lumps and then you carve into them with the background color or the sky color. You go very lightly over the bare trees. And then if I look carefully, there's some sky peeking through, breaking up those trunk areas down in. So I'm creating negative painting to pull out where you see the tree trunks. So start out as big, simple shapes, and then use the sky color to carve into those shapes. Now, at this point, I only have one color in the sky, and I like to actually make the sky a little bit more interesting and complex, but I have to keep it a very light value. So what if I add a very light blue? Almost looks a little too white. Let's use a little bit darker and I have a very pale violet and what I'm going to do is <coughs> just simply mix these colors on, or layer them on top of one another so that they start to kind of blend themselves. Here's a pale yellow and now you're probably saying but now you've covered up all the pink which I have, so I'm going to take the pink back out and pull some more of the pink up into the sky. So it's a matter of playing with it back and forth, back and forth. Now, also at this point, as you can see, is what happened to those bare trees, those trees that don't have any leaves on them yet. I'm going to take a um, kind of a dusty mauve color. That one's not dark enough. Let's go with a little bit darker mauve and just kind of put a haze of color. Now I'm going to take the pink that I used for the block in and I'm going to use it to carve into this tree so that it looks like it has bare branches. And I'm using the harder pastel because it's a little bit finer so I can get a little bit more detail. I don't really it's, it's supposed to just be a hint of a tree in the distance without leaves, so I don't have to go too crazy about it. Because remember, what's the star? It's going to be this hot pink tree, the redbud tree. And I'll just use the pink to carve a little bit more into here as well. Alright, so that's enough for right now in that area of the painting. Let's pay attention to the hot pink tree for a minute because remember that's the star so I'm going to take the darker pink that I have and just very lightly go over where it is and then I need to carve into it because it's not quite that tall in fact they're usually short they're not real tall trees so what do I have to do to make it make more sense is make this tree taller next to it.
So I actually have to take the dark green. And this is a perfect example of why dark can go over light, but if it's really light, it, you can't really get that really punch back. So I'm probably going to have to use a little fixative spray to get uh, a little bit more punch back in that area, which is not a big deal. We can certainly do that. So that's a little bit too pink right there. All right, so I am going to take out the workable fixative at this point. Hopefully it's going to work because it got clogged. We unclogged it and I didn't test it, so that was probably not smart. So I'm going to give, it a, I'm going to give that area a spray. It's working. And I'm going to spray the whole foreground. Oh, see how it's leaking? Something's gotten into that. We're going to have to... Yeah, I'm going to do a video on reviewing fixative. It's in the works. So I'm looking for a new fixative because I've been having pro I've been having problems with this fixative. It it's been clogging up and leaking all over the place. Um, so I'm gonna try to find something different. I have a review coming soon. All right, back to work. Reinforce the pink. And could there be another hint of pink maybe over here? I mean, it's not in the photo, but could we carry it over here? Like maybe there's a little guy over here just to give a little balance. I think we can. Now we want to work on the, the green um, the field. Before we do that, there goes Heidi. It's probably the neighborhood dog walking by the window. I'm using right now the Terry Ludwig eggplant to reinforce some of the dark areas under the trees and also to paint in some of the tree trunks. And you can see how dark this is in comparison to the original darks that I use. I use this sparingly. I use it as an accent rather than putting it everywhere because it has a lot of punch. The other thing I want to be really careful is I don't want a, a line of dark um, at the base of the trees. That becomes what I call a worm shape and we don't want to have a worm shape in our underneath our trees. So now I think because I put fix it if I can get a little bit more color up in that tree. Break it up just a little bit. Alright and now we can work on the the uh, grass. So we're going to start at the back and I'm going to use a lighter duller cooler green to paint the greens in the very distant part of this field. And then I'm going to go and use another lighter, duller, more neutral green in the distance. And I'm going to, and I'm going to use it to kind of break up the tree line again so that it's not just straight across. So I can use this color just to kind of break up and sneak a little bit of grass in between some of these tree trunks. Alright, and then I can get a little bit more. Let's add some dark green on this uh, pathway. I also want to put in a little bit more of that salmon color just to co bring the color down into the field before I add the green and then we can start adding some of the more what I call grassy greens, brighter greens. See what I mean? It's much brighter than the greens in the distance. And I want to lead the eye up to this tree, our star. And you can see that there's a little bit of texture going on because of, of the underpainting and the texture that I added to the original painting before I used the wet rag. So it's working to make it more interesting. Now I'm going to add a more yellowy green, a warmer green, because you know when the greens start coming in in the spring, those spring greens are so bright and so colorful and I like to have a variety in this field. So I'm just kind of going back and forth and creating that interest for variety. I have another really bright yellow-green that I can use kind of to stair-step our way 
towards our pink tree. These are just stepping stones leading us through the field. So the painting where it is at this stage is usually where I stop so that I can reevaluate and decide where I'm going to put the finishing touches. But I'm going to stick with it for this video because I'm going to do the finishing touches right now. But what I do is I pull out my box of miscellaneous hard pastels and I can use these harder pastels to come in and put in some finishing details. Now, so if this tree was supposed to be the star, I'm going to give it a little bit more attention and a little bit more clarity and detail. The other trees are not as important, so I don't want to spend as much time making a lot of detail, but I will add a few branches, especially in these bare tree. Remember, I added that kind of mauve haze. Now I can come in with some hard pastels and actually scribble in some branches. So there's multiple parts to creating that look of bare. Still didn't quite get enough interest in that tree on the left. So I'm going to come in with a warmer green just to give these trees a little bit more shape. And we can give a little bit more detail to our star tree. I'm going to use that hard pastel, that hot pink. And I'm going to paint in, I'm, going to pre I'm pressing very hard, and I'm creating some leaf shapes. Some little dots. <coughs> Those dots are are the flowers. They're not leaves, they're the flowers. And I'll just do a few because if you see a few then your eye can fill in the rest. And I'm going to add a few over here on this side. The other thing I'm going to do is take my greens and use them to paint in some linear marks to make this grassy area a little bit more interesting. So I'm just kind of... seems like I'm scribbling. And in a way I am, but I'm creating some grass, interest in the grass with some linear marks. Again, using the brighter green to pull the eye like stepping stones up to the tree here. We can also use the pink to create more sky holes for our tree. <coughs> like so. And when I'm typically at this point in the painting, I will make a few marks and I'll step back. I'll make a few more marks. I'll step back and I'll ask myself, hmm, do I need it? This mark here is kind of jumping out. Let's kind of soften it. Let's pull some more tree color over it. There we go. Break it up a little bit more. But make a few marks. Step back. Does it need more? Well, maybe just a little bit of grounding right in this area, a little bit of light on this tree. Maybe we need a few um, indications of some flowers in the grass. You know what I think I might do? Something just told me that a lot of times at this time of year there's little um, yellow wildflowers kind of peeking in the grass. So I'll just put a few where I want you to look. Sometimes there's also those purple, you get those little purple violets, weeds. So I'll put a few of those. And this is just kind of my interpretation of early spring and how I went about it by taking a painting that was failed and a rag and doing something that was more pleasing to me. So. If you're looking for something to do, you got a piece of paper or a painting that you don't like, take a wet rag, <laughs> take a wet rag, wipe it out and start over and get a little zen in your studio.